record and get started here. Welcome everyone. I'm Jennifer Statham from the Indian Education for All at the Montana Office of Public Instruction. And welcome to our final Advocacy Award recipient webinar of 2022. Uh, it's just been such an uh, incredible series. So thank you to those of you who have joined us for all of it or who have gone back and watched the recordings. We're so grateful to have had your attention and your ears throughout all of this. I really wanna to welcome tonight our 2022 Montana Teacher of the Year finalist, Chris Pavlovich. I sure am excited to hear Chris discuss taking civil and social justice action this evening. Uh, first, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of healing, I acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the southwestern Montana, Helena, Montana area, the Salish, the Blackfeet, the Kootenai, and other tribal nations, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Nez Perce, Nakota, Dakota, Little Shell, Assiniboine, Shoshone, and the many indigenous people who call it home, past, present, and future. We are recording this. The recording should be available should you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. It should be available by Friday morning at the latest. And um, you will remain all on mute uh, so that we can have a clean recording for those watching it, uh, just as a recording. We will have a sign-in link in chat, but please also let us know in the chat where you're from. Uh, the sign-in sheet on, on the, the Google Sheet is only for if you want renewal units. So do make sure you fill that out before the end of the webinar as we do close that, just as in a live webinar or live workshop. We will have a mentee tonight. So keep in mind uh, looking out and, and listening for the mentee information. If you can't uh, access a different window from your, advice, your device or you're maybe on the phone, no worries. Just you know, answer in chat as you can. Um, as well if you can't go to the mentee, but it, it, it's a really cool mentee activity. The feedback survey will be open the last 10, ten minutes. I promise you we, we read every word of them. All of your feedback so far has helped us improve uh, to get to this point as well as inspire us to do additional types of webinars. So please, 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 regardless of whether you're seeking renewal units or not, please make sure that you complete the feedback survey. Uh, it does help guide us, uh, guide us uh, if for our future work that hopefully will most help you. And uh, as I expressed, this is the Advocacy Award recipient webinar series. And this award, this award is in honor of Teresa Veldkamp. Teresa Veldkamp was an elementary teacher who brought all of her passion for Indian education for all to her career as an Indian education specialist. Teresa was one of the first coordinators and developers of the Indian Education for All Best Practices Conference. We're having our 15th annual conference here in May. We'll be offering information about that in a registration link a little later on. One of Teresa's best friends and colleagues said of her recently, Teresa's approach to Indian education for all was a very personal one. She deeply recognized the importance of relationships as a foundation for her work. Her passion was reflected in an unwavering dedication to Indian education for all, both as a teacher and as an Indian, an Indian education specialist. Teresa advocated for Indian education for all, not just as a legal obligation, but most importantly, a moral one, which is so important to keep in mind tonight. Now about our presenter, Chris Pavlovich was a 2021 Advocacy Award recipient, and I offer her a huge congratulations and mazel tov to Chris for her honor of finally receiving the 2020 Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. She received that award for her science teaching, and it was finally awarded this year. I first met Chris Pavlovich 10 years ago on a very cold, rainy, snowy, sunny spring day at Fort Parker at a collaborative student exchange that former advocacy recipient uh, Robin Lovick and a few of her co-teachers in Livingston and Valerie Falls Down from Pryor created. They, it was called the Building Bridges Building Friendships Program. Since then, she has brought Indian education for all, all the way to Mongolia with place-based educational strategies she shared with teachers there. Chris is an integral part of the Montana Partnership with Regions for Excellence in STEM, or the MPRESS project, and she contributes to the heavy lifting by developing OPI Teacher Learning Hub placed courses such as the Watershed course, which is still available on the hub for free. 
Uh, she also serves as a science assessment item reviewer, as well as providing excellent presentations at statewide conferences and professional development events. I thank you so much, Chris, for all that you have shared of yourself and your growth in Indian education for all, as well as your passion and expertise that you share with teachers far and wide. Welcome. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Jennifer. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here on a gorgeous spring day. I know that that's uh, difficult, and so I appreciate your dedication. And just bear with me while this gets rolling. It wants to be in the sunshine today, too. I guess so. It's really, um, I had a student once that I was talking to and said, Miss Pat, hold on. I'm buffering. It's not buffering. So that's what's happening now. I think I should try it again. I don't know if that would actually help. I do have it in my Google Drive if you have any issues. But in the meantime, um, can you tell us while it's loading, could you tell us a little bit more about Empress? About Empress, yes. So Empress was, I think it was started in 2012, and its goal was to um, familiarize and roll out the Montana science standards. So this was before Montana science standards were even um, invented at that point. And so Montana partnerships of regions for excellence in STEM, you know it's education if you have a, an acronym in the acronym, right? And so it was created to help Montana roll out next generation science standards, really dig into those, parse out some practices and think about what pedagogies um, to pursue NGSS with. And so we were one of the leading states to be able to parse that out. Jennifer, I'm wondering if we shouldn't um, you know, it worked perfectly on our practice, of course, right? I'll just try to pay attention and um, you can let me know when to advance the slides. Okay, I'll just slide. So let's, let's just go ahead and get rolling and go to the next slide so we can get this going. So first off, uh, my deepest gratitude to my mentor in Indian education for all, Robin Lovick. This work would not be possible without your wisdom, which spurred and guided my learning from the first bud. Thank you to my teaching team, leading true professionalism as we learn and grow together. We are indeed stronger together, and we would not be the team we are without the dedicated and unwavering support of our administration, Bob Stevenson, Leah Shannon, and Dr. Lynn Scalia. Um, the when chief, your guidance gave words and consciousness to a professional and personal endeavor. It's been an honor to learn from you. Expansive gratitude to Mike Jetty for deep and honest discourse about the complexities of this topic. And thank you to Jennifer Statham for your unwavering support for teachers and systems which support growth and equality. And then thank you to my fifth grade students for growing and learning with me through each stage of my, each stage of my evolution. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so I am an educator in K-12 public schools in Montana. I'm responsible for historical and modern narratives communicated to the next generation. And I recognize myself in Ladson Billings quote here on this slide. And I accept that responsibility with sincerity. So I seek to examine my curriculum tools and how they serve the system and students engaged in its texts. And um, as part of my personal, positionality in this particular topic. Um, I think that my narrative in my classroom um, needs to serve and protect all students. And I'm very intention, intentional with that narrative because um, I do think that we have a narrative in our classrooms, whether it's intentional or not. Next slide. Next slide. I'm trying. <laughs> 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 so this is an original conceptualization of critical race theory. So I'm just going to jump right into that, right? And um, 
I'm really talking today about a textbook that was utilized in my classroom and that was um, prescribed as curriculum in the K-12 school system that I work in. And so um, this is you know, a real hot topic right now and I had to do some examination. Do I say these words? Do I talk about critical race theory in an hour presentation in which I'm going to be recorded? And the answer that I came to was yes. And so um, you could go to the next slide. Critical race theory <clears throat> is an examination of society through the lenses of systems, power, and experiential truth. It's a compass which can guide educators and lawmakers on the principles. And, um, and I quote uh, Taylor in 2009, a resistance to the unequal and unjust distribution of power and resources. So keep going. And so um, I am going to ask you if you can match the words to its definition. This is something that you can just kind of do on your own um, and like make a little note or a mental note, or you can put answers in the chat. Um, just some ideas, so, you know, get the juices flowing, thinking about these words of accessibility, equity, inclusion, and diversity. So can you match the letter with the number that describes the term? Then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, and so um, here we have a definition of terms. So all the ways that people are different and the same at the annual and group lo level is diversity, fair and just treatment of all members, equity, giving equitable entry to everyone along the continuum of human ability and experience. And we're gonna focus on the experience part today, accessibility, ensuring diverse individuals fully participate in all aspects of the work, including decision-making processes for inclusion. So on this next slide, um, Jennifer's gonna take us to a mentee. Okay, this will, this will take just a second to make sure that I'm on the right page with all the share screens. Um, so you're going to want to go to menti.com, menti.com, and the code that you'll be wanting to use is 5004-0013. Can you see this? Um, is that what's appearing on, on my screen? Is the, the menti slide great? Yes. Uh, so um, we're looking at this picture, and let me... Um, Put it on the pre there we go on the presentation slide so can you find examples of diversity equity accessibility and or inclusion in this image and when you go to www.menti.com m-e-n-t-i.com and use the code 5004-0013 you'll have a little template that you can um enter your answer. And again, if you're not able to switch screens um, and, and you are able to at least go to chat, feel free to answer in the chat. And um, I'll let Chris monitor that since I'm between a couple different um, screens here. Although you might wanna see if, you're, um, if your presentation comes up while we wait um, a few minutes here, Chris, to, to see if folks to populate. Okay, I know we have at least one response on the, I love this picture. This picture, by the way, is from the Smithsonian Science Education Center. And um, I just love if you look at each animal, it's, it's not loaded. It's not anything that controversial. It's just cute little animals. But at the same time, when we think about, I come from, you know, kindergarten was the first grade I ever taught. So when I think of the littles, um, I, they were often like uh, uh, little animals. <laughs> anyway. 
great. Getting more and more responses. And I see that you, you all are trying to get there. So again, menti.com and then use the code 5004-0013. And let me um, escape out of and sorry this is so different from me not having uh, it set up like I usually do but we can I'll put up the results in in just a moment um so are you able to get to your presentation Chris I am not I'm not sure what's going on here but it's the world is testing us so uh, I think we'll just roll with it. Let's see what the um, what the re this is coming in. Here we go. Yay! Here we are. Okay. So diversity equals different characters with the same table, different chairs for different answers. Someone noticed the braille. Everyone has a seat for inclusion. The animals, the drinks, the chairs, signs, abilities, and disabilities all included at the table, sizes, uh, different species, braille, different abilities, uh, a braille invite, different types of cups. I like that the snake had a straw. I noticed that <laughs> when I was setting this up earlier. Um, allowing some to, excuse me, have different chairs, different utensils, accommodating. Each animal has a unique setting arrangements. Awesome. We'll, let's see, we'll go back to the present page. <laughs> Sorry, I have like 18 places to look here. Okay, I think this is your presentation yes. here. Okay. Thank you. So I loved um, everything that we saw in that Minty. And there, and Jennifer, if you just go back to that previous slide, that'd be great. Thank you. And so, as a scholar who has studied critical race theory quite a bit under Dr. Stanton and uh, Dr. Winchief at Montana State University, this is how I see that theory applying to this picture. The picture from the Smithsonian is originally to illustrate diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. But what critical race theory does is we look at that as a systematic, systemic, right? And at the systems level and look to see who's included, um, how are they included, what tools do they have? What is the experience of that person and or animal um, in this case? And how does it compare to others? And I want to um, note that for all of the comments that were listed on the menti, uh, nobody talked about someone else not having something or you know feeling guilty about who is at the table. And so really when we think about critical race theory, we're looking at who is included, how are they included, and on a systemic level. And so we're thinking about laws and then as far as at a school level, I'm thinking about the curriculum itself and how does it include or exclude the experiences of groups of people that I'm representing in my classroom. And I also want to note um, that one of the most beautiful things about this illustration is that there's an empty spot at the table. And so there's always room for more, for more groups of people or for more people to join. It's not, a, it's not a pie, it's open for everyone. And the inclusion of one doesn't take away from the inclusion of someone else. It just adds to the inclusion of different groups. So we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to include um, Idaho House Bill 377. If we click that open and scroll down. Thank you everybody for um, working through this with us. This was um, from 2021, so just last year. And we scroll down to, um, it's between pages one and two. And so what you'll see in the, um, explanation is that it is really helping, it's about that inclusion piece. And so though this bill is has been created kind of in this um, hot spot 
of critical race theory. It is actually supporting what critical race theory does and asking that that's for all groups um, rather than one group or um, minorities. And so we'll go to the next slide back in the presentation. So I'm really building this up. So um, tribal crit is the lens through which I looked at the curriculum that we're going to look at in just a second. And so I know that I'm giving a lot, a lot of baseline and background information before we actually look at something. And this is in response to a panel that we had in 2021 um, for part of the advocacy series. And so it was kind of by request that we go deeper into this topic and um, have it on this conversation about how does tribal crit or critical race theory apply to materials that are being used in the classroom and what does that mean? And I wanna be very clear that um, critical race theory and tribal crit are something that I'm not, I'm not teaching those in my classroom. It's for me to use as a lens, as a teacher and a researcher. I know that for all of us um, in our practices, we are always researching, growing, reflecting and refining our practice, right? And so, and that's, that's part of what I'm doing. Tribal critical race theory outlines the tenet, and I'm quoting this from Bray Boy in 2015, that the US policies toward indigenous peoples are rooted in imperialism, white supremacy, and a desire for material gain, end quote. And there's a lot to unpack there, <clears throat> and it's kind of a difficult thing to read, right? And so thinking about um, what, what resources are used how were they used? Who does it represent and whose experiences do those represent is what I'm doing. So the tenet maintains that colonization is practiced um, and the exploitation and utilization of a quote, vacant land is a lot of the focus, which is from Bray Boy in 2015. Classroom materials, including indigenous stories, um, often propagate dominant interests and narratives, including colonization, which is from Ryder in 2008. And Jay in 2003 describes that if we see schools as microcosms of society, children, particularly those who do not belong to the dominant classes of our society are taught the values, ideas, objectives, and cultural and political meetings of the dominant class. And so systemically, school curricula can be found to reproduce knowledge that does not serve and protect the interests, values, and futures of all students and ignores the humanity of others. And so that's why I wanted to show you that bill from Idaho first, right? And so what tribal crit is saying and what that bill is saying are very, very similar things. So CRT is a powerful tool that can be used by teachers to identify and actively look at power structures in schools by using it as a lens to evaluate curriculum, pedagogy, and systems um, as advocated in the literature. That's from Lots and Billings in 1998. <clears throat> and so we'll go to the next one. And so a little bit about me. I grew up in the Bible Belt of Southeast Missouri. It was a hot spot for the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and messages from the KKK were very prominent, um, both in interactions with peers at school and in formal pamphlets that were handed out by the KKK. And so this, um, this sign is something that I spent a lot of time trying to make meaning out of and make sense of as I was a teenager. I was thinking about like, what does this say about our community? What does this say about who we are? And um, even our high school mascot was the Farming Tonight, you know, which is connected to the Knights of the Realm of the KKK in Missouri. So, you know, I knew immediately that that didn't fit me and it made me uncomfortable. Um, and I was able to dissect messages uh, from the KKK that I saw and heard that were both overt and discreet, but I did not necessarily, even in um, this being front and center in my life, I didn't necessarily bring a critical eye or ear to my textbooks or even um, field trips that I went on as a kid. And so when it came to that curriculum coming from schools, I, I did not see it clearly. And so I wanted to make sure that I included that here. Um, 
I had a fellow, fellow doctoral student recall her history lessons in Georgia. And I'll quote her here, what I can remember from history courses that incorporated indigenous culture is that of a Western perspective with little detail as to the lives or traditions of those of indigenous communities to the Americas. And that's from a personal communication in 2020. And so a lot of times those textbooks are the same as those used throughout the rest of the country and their mainstream messages. And we're gonna look at one of those today. Um, Robin Lovett gave me James Lowen's book, Lies My Teacher Told Me. And that is something where um, the history textbook narratives are pit against other evidence to kind of show that they're contrary depending on who's telling the story. And so that was also a big influence. And so um, one of the most poignant conversations I've ever had about this though for Indian Education for All and about my ontology as a teacher was with Mike Jenny. And he's a member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Chippewa descendant. Um, Robin Lovick introduced us when she invited him to speak to families at our school about stereotypes of Native American people and mainstream culture and media. And he's visited as part of his role as an Indian education specialist at the Montana Office of Public Instruction. Before his presentation, he had dinner with the fifth grade teacher team in Livingston, Montana, and spoke about his experience as a young American Indian in the United States, growing up around mainstream narratives contradicting who he was. And so what I am doing in this um, more formal study in my classroom is thinking about a group of people um, according to tribal crit and critical race, but I always think about that one person and specifically in my mind, I'm thinking of Mike Jetty, you know, young Mike Jetty and what is this narrative um, communicating to someone sitting in that classroom? So we can go to the next slide. So we're gonna look at a textbook that is from the conglomerate um, that's the merging of National Geographic Learning and Cengage. Uh, it's a 2017 edition, so it's fairly recent and it's a fifth grade te textbook. Um, the textbook is published um, under a partnership between this, these two companies and the size of that company can be measured by approximately 5,000 in almost 40 countries. The company has descriptions from districts of 50 states. And so we're thinking about that being a message that is across the United States. Um, and it is also in, um, it also relies on teacher fidelity to the curriculum as a significant variable in success. And that's from the National Geographic Learning website in 2020. We'll go to the next slide. So, I performed what's called a critical content analysis. And this was done and cited by Johnson et al. in 2016. <clears throat> I applied that to this particular textbook. This is the opening of unit six, which is called the Wild West, in which the perspectives of a cowboy, Native American, miner, and settler are introduced um, in the textbooks. And so um, Johnson, Mathis, and Short in 2016 defined critical lens, a critical lens analysis as a critical lens to an analysis of a text or group of texts in an effort to explore the possible underlying messages within those texts, particularly as, relation, as related to issues of power. And so we're thinking of that on the systemic level, right? Not pointing fingers at one, like one person or another group of people. It's about who's sitting at the table what are their experiences and how are those experiences honored and protected? Uh, this particular study was modeled from Rodriguez and Kim's in 2018. They did a study examining Asian American picture books and they were looking for bias, authenticity and identity. The 2018 study examined positionality of book authors, language used in each book and the publishing date as a baseline data for their analysis. Similarly, in this study, I examined the positionality of text and language used for the four specific perspectives, including cowboy, Native American, minor, and settler. So Rodriguez and Kim analyzed whether or not Asian languages were used in the text 
this study placed um, additional analytical focus on specific words used and how those words reproduced um, structures of mainstream narratives or if they um, honored and protected all experiences at that metaphorical table. And so basically I'm looking at the textbook as you did that illustrated table. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a second to look at this table. Um, and this is direct quotes pulled out of the Wild West unit vocabulary and just give you a, a second to like look through those and think about what your reactions are. You don't necessarily have to put those in the chat. I know that this is um, a topic that takes quite a bit of reflection. And, you know, as Martin Luther King said, some self purification to think about if you want to put that on into the world, I invite you to do so if you're comfortable, but I don't want you to feel pressure to do it. So we have some language that's centered in those um, dominant power structures of society. In the introductory portion of the unit, specific word use contributes to the reproduction um, of power structures in educational systems. And so in the table, the words identified to contribute to this are in bold print. And by bolding that subtext, the message, message is clear. Um, my argument is that the text fails to recognize Native American people as human beings on the landscape before settlers arrive in the statement. When we look at a frontier as a place where few or no people live, um, that's in bold, it validates that dominant narrative of colonization and it dismisses values and histories of Native American perspectives. Um, the stance is further supported by the repeated use of the word new when referring to land settled on the frontier. Um, it exemplifies Silveranzo's in 1997's description of, um, you know, looking at the values and behaviors of a dominant narrative uh, while downplaying or ignoring the values and behaviors of a marginalized minority culture. So let's go to the next slide. So the textbook introduces the perspectives of settler, um, minor, cowboy, and Native American within the first page, first few pages of the unit. And, you know, settler, minor, and cowboy, those are all roles based on trades or actions, right, about what you are doing, whereas a Native American is a perspective based solely on race and culture. And so in addition, the verb usage regarding all role perspectives are presented in action tense verb. So look at moved and made in the text. Um, however, Native American um, perspectives, the one perspective based on race is presented in the passive tense with were moved. And so this is uh, looking specifically at verb tense as active versus passive to um, describe different groups in the text. And so while excluding Native Americans as active in historical context, this example validates um, the self-interest of, um, of one group while not necessarily validating the self-interest of another group. <clears throat> so if we go to the next slide. So, in the entire unit, there were no authentic or indigenous voices contained um, in, well, in the introductory pages of the text or in the nonfiction readings designed to introduce the historical context called Westward Bound. Um, the depiction of history is definitely um, centered on those active roles rather than what was considered the passive role here based on race. And complementing that passive tense, the Native American perspectives are also the only images on the page not to be depicted by images of people. And so if you look at this particular page, um, cowboys, um, construction workers of railroads, and settlers who are, are minors are all depicted by historically accurate um, black and white photos of the Native American. 
perspective is not. And so my argument for this is that the perspective is quite literally void of its humanity. We'll go to the next page, next slide. So the one and only image of Native American people is here, and that's in the opening. And so you can see that there are Native American people painted in the center of the picture there. And it's in an art piece primarily focused on um, settler and settler action. This one illustrated image of Native American people compares to eight historical photos of the active roles, three historical photos, well, um, eight photos of settlers, three historical photos of miners, and three historical photos of cowboys. And so the ratio of those active roles versus Native American physical represent representations is 14 to one. And so that one being the one that you're looking at. And so it clearly sets those active representations as dominant in this narrative of this text and reproduces that history and value according to um, the, the narrative's construct. And so the text category, categorization of perspectives um, based on race and a disproportionate representation of those categories removes the values and histories of Native American people and um, reinforces the colonization as that narrative. And this is, you know, it's a really hard thing to like speak into the void about this. And so I, what do you do about it, right? And so if you look at a textbook that's in your classroom and you know that it's in 50 states and 40 other countries, and this is the narrative, and it's not about, um, you know, it's about how can we, what can we do about this? And so let's go to the next slide. And so uh, we're gonna go back to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote a letter, letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963. And he outlines four specific steps, right? The first step is to identify injustices. And so that's what I've done here in um, the critical analysis of the textbook. And so I actively examined the curriculum um, and thought about my own pedagogy. You know, why isn't the story of the Dakota 38 in that textbook? You know, and so what can I bring to the classroom to make sure that the narrative honors all perspectives and that all perspectives narratives are active um, on the landscape and, um, and value those histories? And so bringing in other um, curriculum materials in order to supplement them is something that I'm thinking about as a teacher on a teacher level for curriculum and pedagogy using that CRT lens or thinking about who's at the table, who's sitting in my classroom, right? And what does, what does that mean to those students who are in the classroom? The next step, according to King, is negotiation, right? And so that negotiation for me was thinking about how to bring things in, right? And, you know, it's also teachers are a stronghold for curriculum recommendations with administration, um, talking with other teachers, and then, um, and, and I ended up writing a letter to the textbook company. The third step is self purification. And I kind of referenced that when we opened this up, you know, having this conversation um, in a recorded way, and honest conversation, you know, what what is the purpose of that? What's the meaning of that? What am I willing to do in order to um, make that happen? What am I willing to say on the record? Those are all things that I had to think about, you know, doing some soul searching before coming to um, the table again. And then direct action is the last step. And so um, this, this part is when um, students can start to think about tables as well. And um, by asking students to build their own critical lenses, that does not mean teaching CRT. It means acting on um, the responsibility of my own to all students and to ensure all groups of all student interests are served and protected. By asking students to build critical lenses, thinking about who, who is described, who's doing the describing, of the people in that text, what else do you need to know? Who else would you need to hear from? Why would you choose that particular person to listen to? 
asking those and based on their values and what they're thinking is a critical pedagogy and a critical lens. Um, Friedman in 2007 um, had a beautiful argument that that democratic education can indeed in, occur without indoctrination and that in fact, by teaching critical lenses to students, not critical race theory, critical lenses to students, that we are protecting them from indoctrination. And I saw the danger of a single story put into the chat, which is exactly right. Um, so students themselves can examine texts for bias and ask if all perspectives are served and protected within the narrative. Um, this pedagogy does not come without risk and requires a revisit of that self purification step to risk to weigh the risks against those outcomes but conversations with other teachers and administrators about curriculum that is brought to the classroom is going to be very important for that as well. Uh, schools, you know, they serve a lot of vital roles in our community and in our society and you know. My goal in the classroom is to make sure that I'm not just replicating and reproducing knowledge of the past, but creating thinkers who are also creating new knowledge and thinking about how they're making meaning of stories and the narratives that are around them according to who they are, right? Because when we're thinking about history and literature, I think those are those topics that ask us, who are you? You know, who are you and what do you believe in? What do you want to do? How, what does it mean? And so a classroom in action um, can create thinkers with new knowledge and rebalance and power structures in educational settings. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so click that open. And so, um, I wrote this up into a formal study and with the numbers there and um, Mike Jetty put a comment about self purification makes me think that all of humanity needs a good sweat lodge ceremony for some purification. Love it. Um, so I emailed the company, the letter, the study and emailed them, you know, this is National Geographic, you know, what what your company claims that it's for every learner, right? And, and what who you are as a company, we have an opportunity to do better, right? When you know better, you do better. It's Maya Angelou. So um, what, how can we do better here? And so um, I didn't get a response. And so I ended up looking up the particular authors specific authors of that textbook found email um, for them whether you know via their institutions or wherever they were working and i sent them a specific you know your name is attached to this this is what i found when i'm doing this what about the story of the dakota 38 what about including um, active voices and stories about native american people on the landscape then and now you know what does that look like um, and i attached their legal department and um, their marketing department as well. So I started to get a little bit of um, juice after that. So I was throwing some metaphorical elbows via email and it went back and forth and eventually um, did land a Zoom meeting with one of the executives and um, she agreed. She read the study, she looked at it and she said, I want to do better. That doesn't mean that the conversation and print about cowboys necessarily goes away. They're still at the table. It means making sure that the experience of Native American people is also there and accessible to, for everybody. Um, and so this is the, well, I should back up because first they killed the textbook and said, well, We'll, we're not going to print that textbook anymore. So it's, you know, we've killed that and problem solved, right? No, right? How, especially schools that are in poverty, we know that budget cuts are a huge thing, right? And so what about the schools that are still going to have this textbook for 10, 15 years, right? What are we going to do about those schools? 
because there are schools in 40 countries in 50 states where students are reading that, right? And the message is not necessarily as a fifth grader, even with the overt KKK message coming at me that I was wrestling with, I wouldn't have questioned that, right? You read it, you take it in. I wasn't taught a critical a lens. And so what are we going to do? And so their solution was to um, create an addendum. And so this is a pamphlet that's being sent to every school district that is subscribed to this particular textbook um, in all 50 states and in all 40 countries. And it is making sure that that Native American experience, both then and now, it's even titled that, is at the table. And so this is back to <clears throat> Martin Luther King's um, four steps, right? The identification of the injustice, right? Um, negotiation of what can, what can I do at my own level to make sure that my narrative in the, in the school, in the classroom is intact. How do I collaborate with other colleagues? How do I talk to administration about this? What does that look like, right? And have those conversations that are proactive rather than reactive. Um, and then a self purification of what that, you know, what am I willing to put on the line? And then the direct active, um, the direct action step four was um, within the classroom, you know, making sure that that narrative was balanced. That's something that I can definitely do with what's happening. And my dog just busted in, he's, he's a bandit. Um, and then all the way up to um, the National Geographic lens. And so it was a conversation we had in the school district with administration. Um, and this, this was the result of that, right? And so I ask you to think about, you know, what is in your curriculum? What does the curriculum look like? Well, you know, it's not necessarily a formal study every time, but what can we do as educators on that classroom level where we're thinking about who, who is at the table, whose experiences are at the table, how are they being represented, and does it honor and serve um, those experiences and who's missing, All right? And so um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And this, this is the last slide. And so in an era of education in which administrators and textbook companies are demanding fidelity of textbooks as curriculum, your lens as a teacher and your critical perspective is invaluable. We must answer Bell's call to action from 1995. Think about Martin Luther King's juniors outlined four steps in that letter from a Birmingham jail and apply those to the classroom setting and bring theory of who is at that table access. How do we talk about that every day? What does our scope and sequence of the year look like? Is there a narrative? Um, it, there is a narrative there, but what is the intended and the unintended narrative that's there? Who's included, who's not included? We create thinkers with new knowledge in schools, we also replicate and reproduce knowledge of the past. And so classrooms in action can create thinkers with that new knowledge and rebalance, those power structures in educational city, settings. Um, this presentation calls classrooms to the critical action of creating new knowledge from um, these old and sometimes imbalanced systems. So looking for those and thinking about it and, and having a conversation starting that process. So I really thank you for being here. Um, we've got quite a bit of time at the end for a conversation. Um, Jennifer is going to put up a, because it, and sh just to kind of clarify, um, we can do question and answer on the chat. Um, but this mentee, it's also an opportunity to participate anonymously if this is something that you don't necessarily want your name attached to. Um, that's 
that's definitely doable. Okay, sorry, my little menu bar got. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, if you want to go back to, um, can you see the the mentee uh, screen? Okay, because I my menu bar went missing, so I wasn't able to double check it. But what are your thoughts and feelings about what you've heard tonight? And this is just you know a short answer, and um, and we don't have to share uh, the results of of this part, but we would love to know, you know, what are you um, feeling and thinking? This is a heavy topic. Um, this is a topic where. Um, you know, we, we not only have uh, potential, you know, passions to, to, to do these things, but we also might be in situations where um, we might have some concerns about, you know, bringing these up because, you know, unfortunately, there are places where, um, you know, we might be seen as the minority. And so, um, Chris, while, while folks are thinking about this and, and ruminating on, um, on potential questions that they have. Um, I want to know how, how would we learn to look for whose voice is missing? How, how, how do we acquire that skill and how would we teach that to our students? Do you have any ideas on that? Yeah. Um, I actually take a tally sometimes, right? And so we look for perspectives. Um, we do a lot of species management work in our science classes. And so if we're looking at who's at the table talking about wolves or grizzly bears and who's talking, we'll actually, because something that can look fairly balanced, if you do a quantitative, this is how many times or how much time was given to this particular perspective, you can think about that. Um, but a lot of that comes from a lot of research, right? And so that's something that um, might not necessarily stand out right away, or it will, right? It's it's kind of like in that gray area um, because if you are learning about something on a particular landscape, and you know, for us when we're thinking about species management, I am always thinking about the absolica, right? Because I sit on absolica land, and I when I walk outside, and the land is plentiful and the water is clean. I know that that comes from thousands and thousands of years of sustainable, meaningful management of that land that allows me that privilege to walk outside, right? And so thinking about um, the history of the land, but also modern sustainability, right? And so that we're not always talking about um, specific groups of people in a past tense, I think is always important. And so my, my approach is to do it myself first. And um, students, depending on their lens, because it's a critical lens, right? Your criti how critical that is and what you're thinking about is going to be based on your own experiences and what you've learned and what, you've, um, what you know. And you don't know what you don't know. And that's the, that's the part where you get to, um, I'm thinking as an educator, what about absolica voice in wolf management, right? Is a student in my fifth grade classroom going to think that immediately? Maybe not, but that's where I'm bringing narratives of place-based, you know, place names and um, practices of sustainability so that those narratives are there and bringing them in in a different way. And then we're thinking about who's there, you know? So if my narrative throughout the scope and sequence of my year includes parties at that table, you know, all parties at that table, that's going to help. Now, is it possible to represent every perspective all the time, right? And in full, um, that's, that gets really sticky, you know, and that's where that critical part is important because everybody's lens is going to be a little bit different based on their experience, right? And so 
Um, but if students can think about um, think about those perspectives and talk to each other, you've already multiplied the perspectives that have been discussed, right? Or if I say, what about that? Do you think this perspective should be there? That's you know something that is done too. Yeah, I think science is such a great way sometimes to to it's it it seems like yes, science in itself right now can sometimes also be controversial, but science as far as you know what what it should be as far as the purity of its instruction can be a little bit less emotionally weighted than than history, you know, where where folks may have you know personal ties or personal interests or or whatnot. So. So that's really fantastic. And I know uh, one of the things that I really liked about the picture that you shared from the Smithsonian for the original activity, um, you know, was the, the aspect of accessibility. And, you know, that's something that a group that I am, I am uh, deeply connected to, of what, you know, our leader recently said, gosh, you know, I never thought about the impacts of assess accessibility and I never thought about by not making something accessible. So, you know, sometimes my presenters get a little like, oh, you know what I mean? It has to be, you know, my presentation has to be visually accessible and the pictures have to be in there. And, you know, the thing of it is, is we have, there are all of these accessibility tools out there now. They're, you know, through PowerPoint, through um, the, through Adobe and, and, you know, making a PDF and things like that, places that we can check. But if we don't originally think about, you know, gosh, where are the places that we can, you know, really make sure everyone, and, and sometimes it's just a matter of just making space. And so I don't know, you know, some people commented that they noticed that I put pronouns um, next to my name. And I put pronouns at my name next to my name to let folks that may um, choose to use different pronouns to make to make it a safe place. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it's 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 an opportunity for us to make a, a safe space, you know, for for people who may not otherwise, you know, have a, have a have a courage to express their voice. Um, for teachers who are in, um, I think, you know, situations where it may be controversial, do you have any? Um, words of wisdom or advice for for them to um, to have the courage to you know with, if they have a textbook or materials that are not inclusive and 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 definitely you know kind of are missing the mark especially when it comes to Indian education for all do you have any words of advice for them add to it right and so um, I recognize that we are in a culture of fidelity. Right, and so fidelity to the resource is, um, you know, it's not necessarily the highest form of professionalism for a teacher to think about that if I follow this textbook, then that's where we're going to get the results if I follow it 100%. And a lot of times we know that that's not even possible because those things are enormous um, in the way that they're written. They're written to be to saturate your day in case that is what you're doing, right? And so. My advice is to, especially at the beginning, to add to it, just like National Geographic did. You know, so this is a company that looked back, they thought about what was there. And yes, they killed the textbook originally and they kind of moved, they're moving forward with different drafts, but they also thought in the beginning, you know, to start it out, what they did was to add to it. They put an amendment in order to include some of those other perspectives. And so OPI has a lot of resources for Indian education for all. You know, you guys have been working on that for a long, long time. And inserting some of those resources that are backed by the state, that are listed on the state as teacher resources that adhere to our constitution of Montana for Indian education for all is a great place to start. Because then you have, you have that state backing so actually i'm i just made mike jetty um, a co-host um because i know that he's got some perspectives on here and um and jokes as well but as far as you know especially with the social study standards and um you know being able to possibly so so mike feel free to uh, jump in at any time out here since you have the ability to unmute yourself but if you do have any questions or concerns or um, 
you know, I, ideas uh, that you'd like to, to hash over with us, please do feel free to put those in the chat. Hi, Mike Jetty, welcome. Hello. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been really cool listening to you. And, uh, you know, you're the best example of I've, I've seen of James Banks as a social justice, social action level in a long time, you know, actually approaching those companies and saying, hey, this isn't right. So that's a, that's an inspirational story for all of us. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, I guess, you know, a piece of advice, don't be afraid to start somewhere. I was just in a, at a school district down in the Bitterroot and a lot of teachers were worried about not doing it right. I'd rather, I don't, I'm afraid to try it because I don't want to mess up and offend somebody. And, um, you know, that's, you know, that fear is going to be there, but, you know, like what you're saying, Chris, you know, start small or add something in and, you know, continually build it up. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of folks out there to help you on this journey. And so um, some of these conversations are difficult to have too, but I think, now is exactly when we need to be having them. Um, so I appreciate all your all your insight and perspectives that you've shared because uh, you know it's it's powerful. And so thank you, thank you for being an inspiration to us here at OPI, and for everybody that attended the session. Um, I think uh, it'd be nice to get some. Uh, um, I guess folks at those political levels to have some of these conversations in an open and honest way too. That'd be cool. So maybe we'll get there someday, but at least the students. Are, yeah, Chris, how did your students react to uh, the textbook actually being changed? They're excited. <laughs> They're excited. When I, um, we look at the word new in the textbook and they kind of, you know, surround it with sticky notes and think about um, that word throughout the, throughout the unit and how they feel about that. And, um, we, we do talk and learn quite a bit about Dakota 38 because it fits that timeline and, and what's happening in, I'm not you know, sure that, all of us know what the Dakota 38 is. Could you give us a, a brief synopsis? I could. It's connected to the 1862, um, Sioux uprising. And so, you know, civil war, the North was fighting the South, um, but the union was also, um, fighting indigenous people for West, right? And so there were really two wars happening at that time. You know, typically we hear a lot about the Civil War, but not necessarily about that other one. And so this is following the Homestead Act in which um, that dominant perspective is free land, you make it, you improve upon that land, you know, they call it prove up um, by conquering it and um, growing your own, you know, growing food, agriculture. And so the Sioux were, you know, they were put into um, reservations and they fought, you know, their, their rations were taken from them and were being skimmed off the top is um, how it's been written. And, um, you know, the, the guy who was taking that and distributing it for wealth said, we'll let them eat grass. And they, he was later found um, with, you know, dead with his mouth stuffed with grass as far as, um, as a retaliate, retaliation. And there was, um, there was a war and it was, and it was fought in self-defense, you know, as far as, you know, it's if, if someone came to your house and tried to take that house from you, what would be, what would be the reaction? And they called that the Sioux Uprising. And um, Abraham Lincoln sentenced um, 38 plus two um, Sioux leaders to death. Um, by a public execution. It was the largest public execution in our nation's history. And at, there were um, over 300 that were sentenced to die that day and ended up being 38 plus two. And the Dakota 38, there's a, and, and really not the expert to speak on this, but I will since you asked, they um, have a documentary that's there for free and the message is 
um, resilience and reconciliation. And there are writers that go every year to Mankato and honor ancestors who died um, fighting for their families. I had families on both sides of that conflict from my family history. It's pretty wild. There's a good book called Two Dakota Eyes that uh, shares just all the multiple perspectives from, because not all the Dakota were fighting. Some were, some weren't. And then you get the, the mixed blood folks or the, you know, and so it really was a, a complex deal, but, uh, you know, sad chapter in our country's history. A lot of folks aren't aware of, you know, what's that, Dakota 38? But yeah, it's like, I think it's just part of our healing too, to learn about this. Yes. And, uh, yeah. It continues to be a ride every year as well in honor of the Dakota 38. And I know some folks who take play, take part in that ride every year. And that's the that's the documentary. It's mm -hmm. yes. beautifully yes. done. Beautifully done. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, there, are there any teachers out there uh, in the webinar today that um, have you had any successes that you would like to share about? Um, you know, for, for social action that you may have taken with your students. We'd love to hear from you. Mike, do you want to put that in the chat, the name of the documentary and, and, and maybe a link if possible? Awesome. Thank you. Yay, teamwork. Teamwork makes dream work. <laughs> oh, you have, you've got some love from Ms. Watrud, who is actually in, in Germany right now. She's doing a little teaching over there and joining us. I believe it's in the very early morning for her. So it's always such a treat to have her um, with us. Um, and are there, if there's any questions whatsoever, um, please put those in the chat. Now is a great time. We've got a little bit of time for question and answer and would love to, would love to see those. I'd love to see those. So what's next, Chris? Um, I, you talked a little bit about being a PhD candidate. Um, uh, what, what's, what's next for you for, for both that and for, what's your next social justice project? Uh, I'm not sure. I, it was whatever presents itself. And so I'm always looking with that critical eye, critical lens. And um, right now I'm writing my dissertation. So I'm hoping to be done by this time next year. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking this time to, to do this very important presentation. And again, you know, this, this presentation, Chris mentioned it really briefly um, earlier, but this presentation came about because of our advocacy panel at the Best Practices uh, Virtual Conference last year, the Advocacy Award recipient panel. We will be doing that again uh, this year, um, May 14th uh, will be the advocacy awards for our 2022 recipients and then our, the advocacy panel will be on uh, May 15th on Sunday that's a free virtual conference I put the uh, the link in for registration in the chat so hopefully you will all uh, register for that. Um, but because of, of that conversation um, that started that that day, I said gosh you know do you, would you be interested in, in maybe doing an advocacy panel? So throughout this series, we've covered boarding schools with JC Jeffers, who is uh, on the webinar with us this evening. Thank you, JC, for being here on your spring break as well. And um, then we have Miranda Murray uh, to cover controversial topics and you know how to strategies for covering those, which was just excellent. Uh, Callie Rushi Nicholson covered sovereignty. Um, Bill Stockton, our, our 2022 Montana Teacher of the Year, covered uh, using tribal documents and, uh, and other types of primary documents um, in, in curriculum. So we've had a really incredible, uh, Amy Williams talked about community. Gosh, that was a really, that was a really poignant um, presentation as well. So they've all been just very excellent. But this all came from your feedback, ladies and gentlemen. This all came from um, your contribution. So really, really, this is, um, I want you to feel like you have, have a voice in the next uh, few minutes here. So um, is there anything else, Chris, that you can, you can say to encourage teachers, um, you know, on, 
on really taking a look at this, especially if they do have prescribed textbooks or um, you know curriculum that is that is more or less suggested that they do. Um, what are some of the first steps that they might take when they're thinking? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You know, I've got so much to do, and I've got these committees that I have to be on. I've got this, these IEP meetings to go to. You know, do you have any um, suggestions for how they might find the the energy to to take a more critical eye towards these things? You're not alone. I think that that's the biggest thing to remember is that there's a network. I think there are 40 participants that are still on here. You know, and Jennifer, my all excellent resources. My email is really easy to find. You know, reach out to someone and have a conversation that's that's going to help you think through things. You know, there, there are definitely people for you to reach out to. And I guess, you know, with that, I encourage you to add to the mentee as well. Because I think the more perspectives that we see that are out there, and you know, your name isn't attached to that. And so if you could go back into that mentimeter of what are your thoughts and feelings about what you've heard tonight. Um, I think being able to see that in kind of a shared um, safe space would, would also kind of lift us all up as well. And that, and that helps us so much too, just, you know, even if we don't uh, see it tonight, or if you decide, you know, later you want to go back in and, and do something else, you know, Again, we look at all of these things in order to improve. But um, in the meantime, Mike Jetty says he has a good story to share. So <laughs> perhaps we'll let, we'll let Mike Jetty share this story and then um, I'll make one last announcement. And Chris, if you have anything to add and we'll wrap up a few minutes early this evening. Yeah, um, just in honor of Women's History Month, there was a story about the, these two Lakota men out hunting a long time ago. and. Uh, they were on a path on a trail and they came across this big turtle that was upside down, just having a hard time. So they picked that turtle up, put it back right side and uh, saved it. And the turtle started talking to him and said, you know, I'm a very old spirit. And because you took pity on me and saved me, I'm gonna grant each one of you men a wish. And the first Lakota man said, I wanna be the smartest Lakota man in the world. Poof, he's a genius, he knows everything. The second Lakota man, he's like, looks at his buddy and he goes, hey, I want to be smarter than the smartest Lakota man in the world. Poof, turtle turns him into a Lakota woman. So. <laughs> so there's your there's your bad joke there. So I had to throw in one. Oh, in true Mike Jetty form, in true Mike Jetty form. Thank you, thank you. You're getting laughed at in the chat or la laughed with, <laughs> wait a second probably laughed at too. Um, anyhow, well, thank you so much. The feedback survey is open. Um, please make sure that you complete that, whether or not you're receiving uh, renewal units. Um, again, your feedback has just been so helpful. And um, because we've received the volume of surveys back for each of these webinars, uh, we are able to take that forward and, and justify future um, professional developments such as these this webinar series, the Ethnobotany webinar series. Please make sure to keep an eye on our website on opi.mt.gov and the Indian Education for All pages. Our upcoming professional development, of course, we have information about our conference that has just come um, into being. So bear with us as we collect our speakers and our keynote. We do know our keynote uh, speaker for opening day will be the great Julie Kajun. We could not be happier to have her uh, for that, but it is free, it is virtual, and um, we will be putting up more information for that as well. Coming up on April 2nd and April 8th is a, there are two Saturday workshop series for, the, for ethnobotany. The, they are both also um, fully virtual. The first uh, workshop is going to be with Mariah. Mariah Gladstone in her kitchen with the Indigi Kitchen, and she will be sharing her time with Raina Monteau from Hayes Lodgepole, who will be cooking in her kitchen with one of her elders as well. So they'll be talking about the plants that they cook with and um, some of the ceremonial foods, and it is sure to be wonderful. And then on April 9th, we will have Tim Ryan, and I'll be joining him at uh, in his classroom at SKC as he uses plants as tools, and we'll be talking uh, about ethnobotany from that. Again, free, and the registration 
registration information is on our upcoming professional development webpage. Just below that tab, we have the recorded professional development offerings. Did you miss one of our advocacy award recipient webinars? Then you can go back and watch a recording and receive two renewal units for watching the recording and completing a feedback survey. In addition, we also have all of our essential understandings uh, ser webinar series recordings available and our deeper dive uh, webinar series recordings available. So there are lots of opportunities for you to get two units here and two units there for just watching a recording on your own time. And please also don't forget about the Teacher Learning Hub. We just got completed with one of our first Indian Education for All facilities courses, Unpacking the Essential Understandings, and that was a really amazing course and, and well done. One of our facilitators, again, I mentioned her earlier, Julie, uh, JC Jeffers was um, with us tonight. So keep an eye out on the hub courses. Um, Chris does have her hub course up, which is um, looking at watersheds. And oh, it's really fun. I actually participated in that one. And that one is asynchronous. You can complete it on your own time. So we have lots of resources out there. Um, and, and in addition, there, you know, Mike and myself and Stephen and Zach, we're always happy to um, send you some resources, support you in any way that you can. So please don't ever, uh, you know, feel free to reach out at any time. Chris, thank you so, so much. Um, and thank you for, for getting better so that we could uh, do it this week. Thank you, everyone, for your understanding as we postponed to this week. And I hope you all have an incredible spring break. I'm so jealous that you all get one. I hope you all are staying healthy and um, enjoying some of this warmer weather and um, stay safe. And we will hopefully all see you all at best practices. Thank you so much, everybody.